What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Turnbuckle Topics Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and this is my preview and predictions episode for AEW Double or Nothing. Now, this is where it all began just five years ago, 2019. This was All Elite Wrestling's very first pay-per-view. This was about a little less than five months before they had their first uh, episode of AEW Dynamite on TNC, October 2nd, 2019. But uh, this was a big deal, and it's coming back to the very same place where it all began again at the MGM Grand Garden Arena in Las Vegas, and we're in for a good card. You know, we have 12 matches today, uh, two of which are on the pre-show. We have 10 on the main card. Seven of those 10 matches are title matches. Uh, An additional match has title uh, implications for the future. We have an eliminator match uh, for John Moxley's title going up against Kanosuke Takeshita. We finally have the long-awaited debut of Mercedes Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks in WWE, she debuted with AEW back on March 13th in her hometown of Boston, Massachusetts at the TD Garden. And ever since then, there's been a whole lot of back and forth as far as, you know, this is kind of ridiculous that we're finally, uh, you know, getting her to wrestle. But it's not only is it on a pay-per-view, but uh, she's also going to be wrestling for the TBS championship against one Willow Nightingale. So they're like, what happened to the whole ranking system that was brought back at the beginning of 2024? Where, you know, regardless of, of Mercedes' resume and prior companies, promotions, uh, she gets to jump the line and get a title shot on a pay-per-view, nonetheless. And most likely, uh, she's going to win. I'd say there's a 99.9% chance that uh, she goes out there and gets the victory tonight. Because I don't think you're going to wait two and a half months to finally debut her on a pay-per-view, nonetheless, and have her lose. So I think uh, that would be silly. He TK backed himself into quite a corner here, and so there you have it. It should be a good match, nonetheless, a rematch of the two. We got to see them last May go back and forth. Unfortunately, that's where uh, Mercedes suffered an injury and has been out ever since uh, for the inaugural New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong Women's Championship, uh, where Willow Nightingale went on to win, and then uh, she held it for maybe a month or two, lost to Julia, and Julia held it for the better part of nine months until losing within the last two months. But with all that being said, we're in for a very good show. One thing AEW does do is deliver great pay-per-view cards. And it turns out to be not just good on paper, but the matches uh, lives up to the hype, that's for sure. And as far as their weekly episodic television, Dynamite, a Rampage, Collision, especially as of late, it's been a lot left to be desired, but at least we know this should deliver, as usual. Now before I get to tonight's card and go over all the predictions with you guys here live And typically going into this, I'll have my predictions uh, all ready, all set, and my mind made up. And all I got to do is belt them out. But I'm going to look at this card with you guys, and I'm going to decide on the fly. Of course, I certainly have a good idea for certain matches, like I just said, Mercedes versus Willow. I know who's going to win that one, but I can't really wait to go into this with you guys. But first and foremost, as I said at the top of this show, let's take it back to 2019 real quick. The first ever Double or Nothing, obviously, tonight is the sixth uh, run of Double or Nothing since then. And let's flash back to that card. Now, that was a nine-match card, and we're going to run through it right here. Now, Adam Page uh, won a 21-man casino battle royale. Now, the winner would face uh, the winner of the main event, which would be Chris Jericho or Kenny Omega, for a future AEW World Championship opportunity a few months later, August of 2019, at All Out. Now, Adam Page had won this by last eliminating MJF. Match number two, we had Kip Sabian. He defeated Sammy Guevara. Match three, SoCal Uncensored. That was Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, Scorpio Sky. Uh, They defeated uh, the Stronghearts. Match number four, we had a four-way match in the women's division where Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, got the job done against Nyla Rose, Kylie Ray, and Awesome Kong. Match five, the best friends, Chuck Taylor and Trent Beretta, who recently split after being together for well over 10 years. Uh, they defeated Angelico and Jack Evans. Then we had a six-woman tag team match where Hikiro Shida, Riho, and Ryo Mizunami defeated Aja Kong, Emi Sakura, and Yuka Sakazaki. Number seven. This was a big one. This was a lot of fun. A lot of emotions going into it and coming out of it. This match went almost 23 minutes. This is where we got to see Cody Rhodes go one-on-one with his brother, Dustin Rhodes. It's mostly no growing up, especially during the Attitude Era and such, formerly known as Gold Dust. Or even before then, when he was with WCW, you know, wrestling with his father, Dusty Rhodes, uh, the natural Dustin Rhodes, as he's being referred to now these days. 
Uh, but Cody got the win against Dustin in a very hard-fought battle. Then match number eight, we had a tag team match for the AAA World Tag Team Championships, where the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson, defeated the Lucha Brothers, Ray Phoenix, and Pentagon Jr. And in the main event, this went almost 27 minutes. I mean, honestly, the match prior to this went about 25 as well. So the last few matches were pretty lengthy. All broke to the 20-minute barrier. But anyway, this was where Chris Jericho defeated Kenny Omega and would go on to the next pay-per-view. That would be August 2019 at All Out. And Chris Jericho then also defeated Adam Page uh, later on that year. So again, this was a very good uh, card start to finish, especially being their first pay-per-view under All Elite Wrestling. Just four months prior, they had the announcement of uh, the company actually being a thing in January of 2019 in Jacksonville, Florida. So hey, good for AEW. I know a lot's been said about them. I know they're far from perfect. And realistically, if only their uh, weekly programming was as good as their pay-per-views, uh, they are, there would be no complaints as far as AEW is concerned. But um, I think we've spoken on that quite enough in the past. And so let's get to this card for tonight's AEW Double or Nothing 6th rendition. Again, 12 matches, 10 on the main, 2 on the pre, 7 titles on the line, plus an eliminator match. And so let's get down to business. So why don't we start with uh, the first presumed pre-show match of the night. And it's a shame that it's on the pre-show, because quite honestly, this could easily uh, be on a main card anywhere, even though there's not a title on the line. The match is that good. So we have Thunder Rosa going one-on-one with Deanna Perrazzo. Now, I'm a big Thunder Rosa fan, but I also like Deanna Perrazzo. Deanna Perrazzo from New Jersey, uh, much like I spoke about recently. Liv Morgan, by the way, shout out to her. Uh, I knew she would get it done at King and Queen of the Ring yesterday. Liv Morgan becoming WWE's new world champion, defeating Becky Lynch. So shout out to Liv Morgan. But again, on to another Jersey girl here. Uh, I do see her getting the job done. As much as I like Thunder Rosa here, I think Deanna Perrazzo gets a uh, very strong win in this opening bout of the pay-per-view card. Yeah, again, even though it's the pre-show, they're still going to deliver. These two uh, definitely have been around the industry for quite a while. And so Deanna Prosser gets the victory there. Match number two, we have a trios match. We have the acclaimed Max Caster, Anthony Bowens, and Billy Gunn versus no longer uh, members of the Mogul Embassy ever since turning on Swerve a couple of weeks ago. Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony, Toa Leona and Bishop Khan, uh, now called the Cage of Agony whenever they're, they're together, the three of them. And so, yeah, I'm going to have to go with um, the Cage of Agony. I think uh, it's imperative they get a big win, especially this uh, this being themselves making a big statement, stepping outside of the box and no longer being aligned with AEW World's champion uh, Swerve Strickland and Prince Nana. So they're doing their own thing now. That's fine. I'm actually a big fan of the Gates of Agony, and I like Brian Cage too. Uh, so I think, uh, especially on a pre-show, I mean, what the hell? Let them let them beat the acclaim. There's no reason that they should have the acclaimed and 60-plus-year-old Billy Gunn win this match. And it's no knock to them. It's really not. Billy Gunn's in the best shape of his life. Um, but there's just no need for them to win. So give them some momentum, Cage of Agony, and leave it at that. Now, we're going to jump into the main card here, match number three, but match one of the actual show unto itself, where we're going to have a barbed wire steel cage match for the AEW TNT Championship. And we have Adam Copeland current champion versus Malachi Black. Uh, this is going to be a good one, one that I am very much so looking forward to, even though I think we all have a pretty good idea that Adam Copeland is going to retain. Uh, I think that uh, this match will not disappoint, and it's going to get wild in a hurry, uh, especially if you watch this past week's episode of AEW Dynamite. Uh, being that, you know, uh, formerly known as Edge, Adam Copeland is on AEW. We can't really uh, show any footage or splice any footage from his WWE days, but uh, there was a bit of an ode to his early start in WWE, with the Brood, as Malachi Black has been playing mind games with uh, Copeland for some weeks now, even taking his wedding ring, I believe. And so post-match for Malachi Black, after he got a victory, uh, he was in the center of that ring, and he was showered in what was presumed to be uh, blood. Obviously, it wasn't. Uh, could have been cranberries, for all I know, but it was a whole lot. Uh, TK looked like he spent a couple pyro budgets on that amount, of blood that poured down. It looked like it was literally splashing, not just all throughout the ring, but outside the ring. I think even the people in the first row uh, may have even gotten hit with it. So hopefully that that came out. Really looking forward to this match. I think it's going, again, I think it's going to deliver beyond um, our wildest imaginations. But when it's all said and done, 
in this predictions episode, we're going to go with and still the TNT champion, Adam Copeland. Match four, we have a singles match for the AEW International Championship. We have Roderick Strong, who's been champion for almost three months now, uh, going up against Will Ospreay. Now, this is a no-brainer, uh, just as much as Mercedes defeating Willow Nightingale is a no-brainer. And not just because their level of stardom and talent, but uh, just the way that uh, Will Ospreay has been handled the past week by AEW, obviously, storyline purposes. Will Ospreay always comes out on top since debuting with the company a few months ago. And so this past week, when he was in a tag team matchup, I believe it was on Dynamite, it was Will Ospreay and Orange Cassidy versus uh, Roderick Strong and Trent Beretta. And so it ended with, I want to say, Roderick Strong uh, pinning Orange Cassidy. And so there was a post-match beatdown and all this other stuff where they, they bloodied and beaten and battered a Will Ospreay very badly. And so that only leads me to believe that, yeah, he'll get his lick back real quick. Just a few days later, Will Ospreay is going to get the job done, uh, become the new AEW International Champion. And uh, that's pretty much going to be that. I mean, unless there's some tactics from the outside where uh, Matt Taven and Mike Bennett try to interfere. But even still, I don't even think that's going to really factor in much. Uh, I think that Will Ospreay is going to win regardless here. So I think he's going to be the new International Champion. Believe it at that. And see how long that run lasts. Because... Uh, there's been a lot of rumors being spread the past month or so that uh, many believe that at All In this August, uh, Will Ospreay could possibly be the one to dethrone Swerve Strickland and become the AEW World Champion. Uh, that's right around the corner, you know, so uh, it could also be very telling tonight if Roderick Strong, you know, if I'm wrong and Roderick Strong does find a way to retain and good for him if he does, then uh, then I would think then it's very, very likely that Ospreay dethrones uh, Swerve Strickland this August. But if Osprey is to win this title uh, tonight, and that we're just about three months exactly uh, out from All In, then there's two concerns. It's uh, one: is Osprey going to have an incredibly short reign as AEW International Champion? I mean, what would be the point of him winning if he's set to drop eventually, just so that he could go after the AEW World Championship? It's a very small window, just to maybe boost his. Uh, his resume and the notches on his belt and what titles he's won. Uh, so I don't see the rush in it. I think uh, he should win tonight. Let it be a very lengthy um, title reign. Let him certainly hold it throughout the summer into the fall. Why not? But definitely defend this championship in Wembley this August at All In. And you know maybe if they want to have him win the title at Wembley, do it next year. There is legitimately no rush for him to go to Wembley this August and win the AEW World Championship off Swerve Strickland, especially if you're you're leaning into him winning this international title tonight. So that's what I would do. I think that makes a lot of sense. Continue to build the prestige of this new international title that hasn't even been around for two full years. It was first called the All-Atlantic Championship, which was officially debuted, I want to say, Forbidden Door 2022. Uh, so that would be June of 2022 when it was initially referred to as uh, the All-Atlantic Championship, right? The inaugural winner was Pac, and he won it in the Fatal 4-Way. It was Pac, Malachi Black, and two others that were involved in that initial matchup. He was champ for a while. Orange Cassidy was champ. Moxley, Ray Phoenix, uh, certainly Orange Cassidy again, and Roderick Strong. And I think that's been all the champions. So th that's what I would do as far as that. Let's go to match number five. Speaking of uh, the best friends, as I just referred to a few moments ago, uh, no longer that, you know, Chuck Taylor, Trent Beretta split Chuck Taylor, potentially with a career ending injury. Uh, so Trent Beretta is left on his own. He uh, is no longer affiliated with Orange Cassidy as well. And so Trent Beretta versus Orange Cassidy. And that dating back to that tag team match, I also just mentioned on Dynamite where uh, Roderick Strong and um, Trent Beretta defeated Orange Cassidy and Will Ospreay. And to be quite honest, I think we all know now that Tony Khan is a huge uh, Orange Cassidy fans, so much so that a few years ago he dressed as Orange Cassidy for Halloween. And there's nothing wrong with that, so be it. But uh, it's always an, ad an added advantage when your boss dresses as you for Halloween. That being said, besides the fact that Orange Cassidy opened up a Dynamite this past week for the 5,000th time, uh, <laughs> champion or not, uh, I think it's pretty obvious and telling. I would be pr very surprised at the outcome if, if that's the case. Uh, but I think Orange Cassidy's going to uh, get his revenge 
and defeat Trent Beretta tonight, even though I think Trent Beretta could certainly use the momentum now that he's back in singles consistently, no longer, again, part of the best friends and the tag team. Trent needs to win more than Orange Cassidy, believe it or not, folks. But uh, the way I see things, the handwriting's kind of on the wall that Orange Cassidy is going to get the job done. Well, because that's Tony Khan's guy. And so so there you have it, much like uh, Hook is typically uh, Tony Khan's guy, too. He's got a thing for the the small wrestler, you know, that David and Goliath complex. I think, you know, he, he feels as if um, he puts himself in these smaller wrestler shoes and has them go out and get the victory. So be it. So... Orange Cassidy for the win. Let's go to match number six. We have a trios match uh, for the Unified World Trios Championships. And we have the Bang Bang Gang, Jay White and the Guns, Austin and Colton going up against Death Triangles, Pac, Ray Phoenix, and Penta L Zero. So, man, I am so glad to see Death Triangle back. You know, Ray Phoenix, he's been riddled with injuries the last couple of years, but uh, it's good to see him in action. You know, as much as I do enjoy all three of them in singles, uh, they're back in action. And honestly, as good as a match as I think this will be, uh, I do think that the Bang Bang Gang, White and his boys, should retain. Uh, there's no reason to take the Unified Trios Championships off of them. Continue their momentum, this Bullet Club Gold. I really like what I'm seeing here, and I think that uh, give them more and more time uh, to showcase their skills. We all know Jay White's incredible. That's a foregone conclusion. I think the guns in the last year have elevated a lot uh, alongside him. I always thought the guns had potential in the tag team division, and they, they do. I mean, they're former AEW World Tag Team Champions. It wasn't a very long reign, but they were champions for a little bit last spring until losing to FTR in New York, which realistically should be a crime because I was there for that, and that is when they had the special entrance uh, when the guns came out to Many Men by 50 Cent. And that song means a lot to me. I mean, I got my high school uh, graduation yearbook quote from Many Men uh, from 50 Cent under my picture, so that just goes to show you uh, how cool I thought that was. That was an amazing entrance, but uh, they dropped for FTR to become the two-time World Tag Team Champion. So it's what it is. It was a good match nonetheless. And so I think that, you know, this is uh, a great run that they've had since then with Bullet Club Gold in Trios, winning the Ring of Honor titles last month, winning uh, the AEW World Trios Championships, Unified Champs alongside Jay White. And I mean, that's momentum, you know, to, to be quite honest with you. So I hope for the best with them and to retain. Let's go to match number seven. We have a three-way uh, FTW rules match for the FTW championship where we'll see uh, the current champion, Chris Jericho, with Big Bill, formerly known as Big Kaz, uh, going up against former champion Hook and Katsuyori Shibata. Now, this match should be good. I mean, Jericho, Hook, you know, their most recent match was that at Dynasty last month. Uh, it was okay. A lot of us were shocked at the outcome. That was one of the very few losses I had on that card. Uh, definitely did not think Jericho would, needed to win another championship, but here we are. And so he's going to have his insurance policy now that Big Bill is affiliated with this whole Chris Jericho learning tree business. Um, personally, I'd love to see, forget Hook getting his title back, I'd love to see Katsuyori Shibata uh, win this match in general, title or not. Uh, but you know there's going to be foul play, there's going to be funny business, and that's just the way uh, it's going to go here with this heel, uh, this new heel stable with Jericho and Big Bill. So, uh, and still, FTW champion Chris Jericho with the help of Big Bill ringside. Now match number eight. I was telling you guys there was a Eliminator match with a future uh, title shot stipulation. Now, this is for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship uh, Eliminator match. Again, if Takeshita, uh, Konosuke Takeshita is to beat John Moxley, then he will get a future uh, IWGP World Heavyweight Championship uh, title match. Now, I could certainly see these two uh, eventually having another match for that title, which I think they should. I don't know, something, my gut is telling me to pick John Moxley, that he's just going to win this and forge forward with his... A title defenses, although it's a title that's outside of AEW, uh, I still do think that, um, you know, they still book it pretty importantly on AEW shows because they have that mutual respect for New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's going to be a good match. We know that. You know, again, a lot of these matches on this card, I wouldn't even care if there's a title on the line, much like I said about the first match that's on the pre-show, uh, Thunder Rosa versus Deanna Parrazzo doesn't even need a title. Um, the only thing that would probably would have got that on the main card is if there were a title on the line, I get that. Uh, however... I'm going to go with John Moxley. I think he's going to uh, win this one and, and uh, uh, put to rest a future title shot for Takeshita. But hey, look, if I'm wrong, I'm not even mad about it. Uh, Takeshita, not only would I like to see him uh, win tonight's match, I'd love to see him go on and defeat Moxley to become champion. Because Takeshita, he's been around for well over a year now, and I know he's uh, you know, kind of voiced some frustrations of his on social media in the past um, as far as 
how he's been booked. He's been presented good, like he's with the Don Callis family the past several months, and you know he goes on these streaks. You know he goes on hot streaks and cold streaks. So get some wins and some some momentum, and then he cools off. Obviously, it's all a booking aspect, a booking standpoint as far as how TK and company want to. Uh, you know, present him and push him, but I'd love to see some gold around uh, to catch this waste uh, one way or another. So uh, that's that's that. We're going to go to match number nine here for the AEW Women's World Championship. We've got Timeless Tony Storm uh, with Luther, Mariah May going up against Serena Deeb. Again, this should be a nice exhibition, quite literally. Taking it back since Tony Storm likes to use, uh, you know, her character from many years ago. So exhibition is the appropriate terminology for this kind of match and honestly they're going to put on a clinic tony storm serena deeb they've both been in in pro wrestling for a very long time and so uh, they know what to do you know when push comes to shove to put on a good wrestling match it's going to be a good one but i think we all know that tony storm will still retain her championship when it's all said and done regardless how much effort serena d puts forth um don't be surprised to see some funny business at the end much like big bill uh, is going to help jericho i think we see mariah may and company uh, go on to help timeless tony storm get the victory, retain her championship and move forward. I could see her dropping at a I could see her dropping her title at all in this summer though. I, I think towards the end of the summer is when she gets dethroned by who? Not quite sure, but we'll see how that goes. Now we have another women's match here and uh it seems to be the only one people are talking about. And I get it. It's the AEW TBS Championship where Willow Nightingale will be defending her title that she won last month up against the debuting Mercedes Monet. Now, again, as I said at the top of this show, she debuted with the company as far as showing up at Big Business March 13th in her hometown of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it was great to see her. I, I was very thrilled to see her. I'm happy for her. Obviously, a lot of the diehard WWE fans wanted to see her back in WWE as Sasha Banks, including my wife. And I'll tell you what, I would love to see her in, in WWE too. I, I really would. I enjoyed Sasha Banks, the character, and so on. And and she did a lot of good uh, while there. For a very, she was there for a very long time. However, this is a personal journey of hers. I respect that, uh, whether we agree with her or not. And so I support her in AEW. Hope she does good. I really do. But I mean, debuting her um, March thirteenth. You know, showing up every week for a promo or a backstage segment. It's like get in the ring and wrestle already. And and. Yeah, the thing here was, is she even clear to wrestle, right? That was the thing. Are they prolonging this? Because she may not be ready up until maybe days or a week or two prior to, uh, to AEW Double or Nothing. Even if that were to be the case, then I don't know. Why why have her show up so early? Again, I know it was her hometown of Boston. But man, then to just have us wondering for a couple of months. And then she shows up. Not just for her first match in a couple of months, but now she's showing up for a title opportunity that she's very likely going to win. So, I mean, I know she comes off just like she was the boss in WWE. Uh, she's now going by the uh, CEO in AEW and keeping a very similar energy. But, man, I don't know. I can't I be honest with you guys. I'm not crazy about how she's been presented week after week. You know, initially I was, I was excited. Now it's just like... Uh, is there going to be any kind of fight? She's just going to run through the competition. We all know she's great. Um, but is there going to be any semblance of wonder? Like, you know, so th that's the part that I'm not crazy about. You know, at least when Deanna Perrazzo debuted with AEW January 3rd in New Jersey, by the way. And, you know, and that's the thing I appreciate about Tony Khan. He likes to give a lot of his wrestlers homecomings, whether it's a big pay-per-view match in their city or debuting in your city, you know, he does all this kind of stuff, and that I appreciate, you know, just like Soraya last summer, a one in the UK, and that was all well and good, but, you know, so, so back to Deanna Parazzo, debuted January 3rd, and two months later, March 3rd at Revolution, she already had a uh, AEW Women's World title shot against Tony Storm. Now, granted, even though that was expedited pretty quick, at least Deanna had a lot of matches under her belt. At minimum, she had eight matches, I want to say, and even if she did win them all, at least she actually had the weekly matches. They didn't waste any time. Dynamite, Rampage, Collision. She was out there. She was on there. She was having bouts. She was having fights. It was, it was getting messy in the ring, backstage. And she was, you know, a, as we want to see. We want to see these wrestlers wrestle. But then here, very similar situation, right? Just like uh, Deanna was two months, but at least she was wrestling. Mercedes, two, now two and a half months. And she hasn't wrestled not one match, nothing. And again, a lot of people, the crutch they put it on is 
quite literally, because she was injured, like, oh, she just may not be ready. So, okay, and if she's not ready, then don't bring her back for an immediate title opportunity. You know what I mean? Let there be some kind of a, a battle or fight on screen outside of just returning. I get it. It's it's a battle getting back to the ring. It, it's a lot. It's very rigorous training, the conditioning. Uh, I understand that completely, but it just... Um, it kind of defeats the purpose when, you again, you have the ranking system and you kind of jump the line just because of who you are. And so that's what kind of rubs me the wrong way. Even if she is coming back as a heel and not a baby face, uh, I still, regardless of the character work, I, I think that's irrelevant. So we'll see what happens. Going to go with Mercedes Monet getting the win here and new AEW TBS champion. And we'll see what happens going forward for her. You know, I wish her all the best. And uh, so we'll see how this reign goes. All right, so now we're down to our final two matches. We have Anarchy in the Arena. Where the elite, Kazuchika Okada, Jack Perry, and the Young Bucks, Matthew Jackson, and Nicholas Jackson versus Team AEW. A very hobbled Team AEW, might I add. You have Brian Danielson and Darby Allen, which the two of them, I don't know if they make one at this standpoint. And then you have FTR, Cash Wheeler, and Dax Harwood. This is going to be a gritty battle. It's going to be fun, especially from the standpoint of, you know, those that are trying to represent the brand AEW. And, uh, of course, the elite, who think they could walk all over people because they have Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, the EVPs, who, who helped bring Jack Perry back to AEW, storyline-based ever since the incident with CM Punk back in August at All In. And then the arriving Okada, who came uh, to AEW a couple of months ago, initially becoming Continental Champion, and they've been running roughshod over everybody. Even Tony Khan, right? Jack Perry knocked Tony Khan down in a very comical fashion wearing the neck brace at the NFL draft. Live in the gimmick, brother. So anyway, uh, this is going to be a fun one. I could definitely see the Elite winning here. Uh, but then at the same time, I could just as easily see Team AEW winning. Uh, this is a rough and tumble team. Again, even though uh, the two don't make one with Danielson and Darby coming back from... I mean, Darby Allen, what, he uh, broke his ankle? Or was it his leg or something like that? And then got hit by a bus. The, the, the first injury was in-ring. Then the second injury... Uh, was in, what, crossing the street in New York last month. Got hit by a bus. I mean, my goodness. And now he's back, replacing the injured Eddie Kingston. I, I think uh, even though Eddie and, you know, speedy recovery to him, he's got a, quite a few things going on since his injury last week. Meniscus, ACL, a couple other things. Um, <laughs> he's not much worse than Darby Allen. So it's kind of crazy that Darby's even back in the ring in any aspect, even though this match... Uh, collectively probably won't take place in the center of the ring, being it's anarchy in the arena, just like the stadium stampede matches. They're all over the place, uh, in the stands, in the hallways. So who knows? Uh, this could really go either way, but I, I suppose I have to pick a side, and I'm probably going to lean with... I'm pro Man, this is hard. This is a lot harder than I thought, man. I You know what? I think I'm going to go with the Elite. You know, I can't say I'm a thousand percent confident in that, uh, but I think I'm going to go with the elite because they have to maintain that level of um, that snootiness, that uh, win by any means necessary. We're going to find a way to get the job done, even if it's in a corrupt fashion. Maybe they'll find a, another alliance to help them throughout. Maybe some some people within the company or, or outside of the company. And yeah, I just see them beating AEW. I mean, honestly, because Danielson, he's beat up, man. Darby Allen, he's beat up. Regardless of the stunts he pulls during this match, I don't think it's going to matter really. And FTR, great tag team. One of the best tag team duos in the ring for sure. But being that this match collectively is going to be outside of the ring, and it's really like Jack Perry's return, if you think of that. Uh, Jack Perry's returning. Okada, I know he's... I don't know how he does in these kinds of matches. And, you know, Matt and Nick Jackson, they're no slouches. They do a lot of foul stuff. So I'm going to go with the elite. I give them the slight edge over Team AEW for Anarchy in the Arena. And that leads us to the final match of the night, the main event for the AEW World Championship, where we have champion Swerve Strickland alongside Prince Nana, first Christian Cage alongside Killswitch, formerly known as Luchasaurus, Nick Wayne, and Mother Wayne. Now, this is going to be fun. I think it's going to be a lot better than people think it will be. A lot of people may think Christian is washed, especially if you haven't watched AEW. You may just be ignorant to the fact, but... Uh, don't get it twisted. Christian Cage's in-ring work has been just as good as his character work, where it's been some of the best character work of his career. He's really leaned in uh, to this heel side the past year and a half, two years, 
and has been doing a fantastic job building the patriarchy uh, with all these members, Killswitch, Nick Wayne, and Mother Wayne. Uh, that being said, though, as good as this match is going to be, as uh, likely as it may look for Christian to get the win, especially due to the outside interference during this match, uh, Swerve Strickland's going to retain. I mean, come on, what are, what are we talking here? The man just won the title uh, last month at Dynasty, April 21st, and you think they're going to take the title off of him in just uh, just over a month? That would be ridiculous. That'd be asinine, and it just wouldn't be right in, in many a way. So, at minimum, he should be uh, bringing this title again into All In in August. And if he were to drop there, whether it's against the likes of a Will Ospreay or somebody else, I wouldn't be crazy about it. Uh, you could say, oh, he had a pretty solid uh, four month reign, defended it a lot. I mean, geez, he's defended it a lot in this past month. I think he had a title defense, what, three, four days after uh, he won the thing at Dynasty. So, They've been overutilizing him, overexposing him quite a bit, even though Swerve always delivers. I think they should uh, calm down and cool off the fact that they have this uh, baby face uh, fighting every which way at every opportunity. And so, with that being said, and still AEW World Champion, Swerve Strickland, again, he gets the win. And that is my predictions episode for AEW, Double or Nothing. Again, looks like a solid card, M much like most of their pay-per-views. I think we're in for a good one. And um, just super curious going forward, what's going to happen with Mercedes Monet, who's likely going to be the new TBS champion. That's going to be something to watch for. Um, who's going to be the future opponent for Adam Copeland, assuming he retains against Malachi Black? Will Ospreay, what's going to happen with him? Should he become the new international champion? Uh, who will be his list of opponents, which I'm sure will be a, a bunch that he runs through before he gets any a true competition as far as someone potentially dethroning him. And then again, like I said earlier, if he is to win the international championship, that should rule, rule out the possibility of him the dethroning the likes of a Swerve Strickland come August at All In. Outside of that, again, I hope uh, Jay White and the Guns should retain those trios titles. FTW championship, I don't care if Jericho retains, Hook wins it, or Shibata wins it. I mean, I'd be most happy for Shibata. And uh, is there anything else on here that really grabs my attention? No, that's just about it. So again, thank you all for tuning in to my predictions episode for AEW Double or Nothing. If you're watching the pay-per-view tonight, have a good time. Hope everybody has a fantastic and safe uh, Memorial Day weekend. And enjoy yourselves. You know, it's been a great weekend for professional wrestling. Always is. It's a lot. It, it's exhausting when you have the back-to-backs if you watch both companies like myself. So... You know, early Saturday, you had WWE King and Queen of the Ring, although it was only a five-match card, six technically, with the pre-show match with the Women's World uh, Tag Team titles. And now you have uh, Double or Nothing Sunday night, another 12 matches. So 18 matches, that's a lot. Not to mention if you tuned into Collision Saturday night or even SmackDown Friday. I mean, it just never ends, right? Um, so, But you can never get enough pro wrestling. It's one thing I've learned. All right, folks, well, thank you for tuning in to the Turnbuckle Topics podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening.